Okay, let's stand and turn to page 57. Okay, now I'm going to resolve a great problem you have. I know you all have learned, what is this? Uh, did you notice it this morning? Did you wonder what it was? What do you think of it? <laughs> what do you think it was? <laughs> Be sure soon will find you out. Timmy, pick it up for me, please. <laughs> We're getting technical around here, and uh, still in one piece. And it says 67. <laughs> so No, it says 72. 72. And uh, this is just a temperature deal. Uh, because we're trying to keep as low as we can in here without cracking the sounding board like we did before. We kept her way down to 62 during the week. Then uh, we got a cracked sounding board. And our uh, thermostat back there doesn't seem calibrated with what it says. Set it on 70 and you get about 67. So they shut her down to 68. And it goes down back there. It says 63 or 4. When I come in, it doesn't seem that cold. So I thought, well, all I'm concerned about is the piano. I can handle anything. And so... I uh, just sort of wondered uh, what it was, and so I stuck that up there and forgot it. I forgot it again tonight, and everybody asked me about it this morning. So uh, that's, that's what that is, or that's what that was. <laughs> okay? All right, take your Bibles now and turn to Acts chapter 26. And this is uh, going to be lighter than light tonight. Very light this morning. And it's going to be... Uh, very light tonight also. And this is going to be directed at the uh, children a lot. Uh, it's going to be directed at uh, everybody somewhat. And this is, uh, this is uh, what I call P.S. And this message, if you're going to put a title to it, I just call it P.S. Mind Your Manners or Common courtesy. Acts chapter 26, verse number 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning. If they would testify that after the most straitest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise of God made unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. And I'm going to stop there. I want you to look at verse number four, my manner of life from my youth. Then there's something about you that is going to be known and always be known, how you conduct yourself from the get-go. That's from the start. That's for a youngster. That's for a youth. All the way up. Folks know how you conduct yourself. Your manner of life is known. People are not blind. People notice. They may not say anything. They may not say anything to me. They may not say nothing to you. People notice. Your manner of life and my manner of life is known. Has been known. Is known. Will be known. And so, P.S., I want you to mind your manners. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful now for the Word of God. I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit of God would take this uh, message tonight, uh, this very light message, and I pray, Lord, that it would be used, for it would be a blessing for each one here, from the youngest all the way through. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be extremely careful with our manner of life. That's each one of us. And, uh, Lord, that uh, we're known. We're known one way or another. And, God, I pray that uh, some way or another, that uh, you'd make this a blessing. And our uh, Lord, give to us what we need, and I'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, uh, like I said, just a very, very light message tonight. And uh, this just has to do with, uh, this is the P.S. I think I said something about manners one time not too long ago, and uh, somebody said to me, I wish you'd said more about that. 
And then they gave me a little book pertaining to manners. And I looked at it, some very interesting things in that. And some of it I probably will have incorporated, I'm sure I have, uh, in what I've got to say tonight. So it's very, very light. It's down, uh, down around, uh, you might say, the youngster's level. But it's important that uh, you learn to mind your manners. That's very important. The sooner, the better. I'm sure that you, like myself, most of you adults, you were taught manners at home. I was taught manners when I went to school. When I went to grade school, we were taught how to talk to the teachers. We were taught manners all the way through. So much so, I got to thinking of eight grades in J.J. Uh, Burns' school down here. Uh, and I can only think of the first name of three of the teachers. The first grade teacher, they called her Miss Mary. I don't know her last name. Everybody called her Miss Mary. Second grade teacher was, uh, I think, Miss Bowen. Uh, third grade teacher was Miss Carringer, and she is my favorite, and uh, her name, I believe, was Helen, as I recall. Fourth grade, let's see, uh, Miss Knuff, I don't know her first name. Fifth grade, Miss Smith, don't know her first name. Sixth grade was Miss Brown, don't know her first name. Seventh grade, Mrs. Ross, don't know her first name. Uh, eighth grade, Miss Jones, and I believe it was Sarah. So I know two, maybe three out of eight grades. Because you were taught to respect your teachers. You were taught manners. You were taught manners in grade school. I went to high school, and I went to McKinley High School for two years. And uh, it was a little bit on the uh, rude, crude side there. But we had one teacher there that taught you some manners. His name was Ted Henning. Ted Henning was a big guy. He was big, I mean, probably about six foot two. Ted Henning was big this way. Ted Henning was uh, big this way. Ted Henning was just a big man. Ted Henning had machine shop, and Ted Henning taught you some manners. He taught you that you are going to respect the teacher, you're going to respect your elders, and uh, you're going to respect them or else. And the or else had to do with what they call corporal punishment, the unpardonable sin these days. He had a board about yay long. He had a little handle carved in the handle there. The thing was about this wide. It was about probably, I'd say, at least a half inch thick. It wasn't three quarters of an inch thick. And he had holes drilled in it. And so that, I mean, there was nothing to keep that baby from flying. And uh, he would take you and have you, you know, somebody messed up and talk smart, uh, you know, uh, talk back to the teacher. Uh, you got the horse out. You bent over that horse. And this guy gave it everything he had. I mean, he did not hold back at all. He took that baby, and I mean, he wham! He nailed you. And uh, I didn't, didn't see anybody in that class, including myself. Uh, when you got nailed, you flew off that horse. You came up off that thing, and uh, he taught manners. He taught respect. I went to Timken High School, junior and senior year. I went to auto shop over there. Mr. Harmon, initially, right off, we started, get go taught us some manners. You don't do this. This is why you don't do this. You don't do this because of this. And taught us some manners. Everywhere you go, people want you to have some manners. They're going to teach you some manners. That's how life goes. I got out, got into construction work, and uh, that was uh, probably anything but manners in uh, a lot of the construction areas there. Uh, but then uh, I noticed this. When I went down south, I uh, run across folks that had some manners. Down in the south, most of the folks say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. No, ma'am, no, sir. You were, they just addressed you with courtesy. Uh, that just part of the way it was down in the old south. Now, I don't know what the new south is like. It's probably about like it is up here uh, because being so infiltrated with Yankees or northerners, it's probably not too far off. But when I went down 65, you still had the old south, and the courtesy was still there. Now, I've gone the other way, I've gone to the north, and I've gone up there and I've got cussed out because I went around the corner didn't know exactly where I was at. This is in Pennsylvania, I believe it's Pennsylvania. Uh, but I, uh, and so I'm trying to figure out where I'm at with an Ohio license tag, and man, horn is beeping, cursing, flying by you there, a myth like you couldn't believe. I'd hate to think what New York City would be like. I mean, I wouldn't even want to be near a place like that. Nonetheless, uh, teaching manners, my manner of life, now, yours is known and mine is known. Uh, Don Pensacola and I went there. Uh, we, at the start of the year, Dr. Ruckman taught us this. He said, I address you guys as Mr. Martin, Mr. McGraw, Mr. Bemis, and if I do that to you, then you can address me as Dr. Ruckman. And so nowadays everybody calls him Doc. 
dot this and dot that, and I just never have gotten that groove. Wasn't that way when I was there. It was Dr. Ruckman. He's still Dr. Ruckman to me to this day. And, of course, he deserves to be, deserves uh, uh, what you say. Somebody that can stay in the battle all the way to 84 years of age. Somebody that uh, has gone what he's got going. All the degrees are earned degrees. Uh, they would deserve your respect. And so you never go wrong along those lines. You're taught manners at home. You're taught manners at school. You're taught manners in the military. Say, how do you know? I don't know, but Rick, you've been in the military. Tell us something you learned in the military, manner-wise. Say it again. Covers come off when you walk in a building. Okay. Um, always address higher ranking uh, official as sir or ma'am. Hmm. All right. Tim Eller, you were in the military. Tell us something you learned along those lines. Well, I learned uh, when you was in the presence of an officer, you had to greet them with a salute or attention. You just did flippantly, you know, hey, how you doing? Praise the Lord. There's, there's what you call a ton of manners, realistically. There's a bunch of them there. That was important. If they did not keep the manners, and they paid the price. The manners are always very, very important. Your manner of life is important. Doesn't matter where you're at. No matter whether you're young, whether you're old. Doesn't really make any difference. I go to the post office, and I'm taking a bunch of packages in. I got a bag of uh, an old paper bag with some uh, uh, New Testaments and stuff that I'm mailing out uh, on this side over here. I got two or three boxes in my arm here. Come up the door, and the door hinges both ways. And so I can just, you know, go like that and push it and squeeze on in and go on into the post office. But as I got up there, a lady, an older lady, uh, was coming out of the post office. And she grabbed the door and said, uh, I will be a gentleman. I'll open the door for you. She didn't have to, but I said, thank you very much. I'll be a gentleman for you. I'll open the door. And, uh, you know, that uh, that's always kind of a blessing when you run across situations like that. I went to Altman Hospital, Shirley and I, and I forget who we went to visit now. It's only been about a week or so ago. And there was a big dash guy, uh, and he was with his girlfriend. They got off the elevator in front of us, and he had a coat that went down longer than my suit. Well, probably about like this. You know where his pockets were? Here's where my pockets are, right there. You know where his pockets were? They were below his coat. And I thought, what is this? And that this fellow was so bad, he just about lost his britches, to be honest with you. I mean, he took a couple steps there and he had to go like that. Just about lost it. That's the day and time in which we live. That's the day and time in which, you know, being crude and rude, and that's rude. I mean, to uh, dress like that in front of the public, in front of youngsters, in front of young ladies, that is rude and that is crude. So, uh, you know the distinction there? I mean, uh, one's, uh, I'll be the gentleman. I'll open the door for you. Somebody else, they're going to, you know, be, see how, you know, rough and how crude they can possibly be. And, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, courtesy was in. It used to be that people wanted to look as good as they could look. The young ladies, they primped and primped and primped. The young men, uh, they used to uh, try to look as nice as what they could. I used to, when I had hair... Comb my hair like Timmy. Timmy, stand up and turn around. <laughs> He's going to be old grandpa tonight. <laughs> now, you know what old grandpa looked like? That's what I used to look like. I used to have hair, and I could just take that thing, you know, and, and uh, swish it on back, make a little old hump here, and, and uh, uh, you know, take this side here and put a little, old, you know, wave on this side of hair. I used to be able to do that. Be uh, rather difficult nowadays, and so uh, not able to do that. But that used to be how it was. You wanted to look as nice as what you could possibly look. 
Uh, nowadays, it seems like as though uh, the charm is in being sometimes as cruddy as you can look. I've seen a bunch of that around town where I can't believe that anybody would give them time of day because you're looking at a crud, you know, to put it mildly. Uh, used to be that charm was really where it was at, and it was more important than looks for you to have some manners and to be able to have some charm to show to the young lady, to the young man. I had an uncle, I uh, lived in Painesville, and he was, uh, he was on the ladder a little bit more than normal, up the ladder. When he'd come, uh, he and his wife come see my mother, my mother's sister, younger sister, and my Uncle Kenny would always talk to me, and he'd uh, talk to me not about himself, though he had a position, I was a bricklayer, that's all I was, just a bricklayer, and he had a position. But he never talked about his position. He always talked about me. How you doing? How's it going? How's the business going? Yeah, we got a guy in Painesville. He's a, he's a contractor and uh, he does this and does that and never ever mentioned anything about himself. Always the conversation was round about you. He's very enjoyable always to be around. He was that way. Uh, those manners seem like as though that uh, they were a plus. There's no doubt about that. I went to see Steve's aunt on Friday night, and uh, when I said I'm looking for Ruby's mail, she said, you're Steve's pastor, and she was so glad to see me. I went Saturday after she'd had the heart attack, go to Akron General up there, and she was just thrilled that I came to see her. I'm not magic, but I can read the Bible. I can put a couple of verses out there. I can say, this is what you want to do. You want your heart to get strengthened? This way you got to do it. You can't worry about everything. You can't be full of care for anything. Be careful for nothing but everything but prayer and supplication. And you can pray right now as well as you ever prayed in your life, as well as I can pray. Uh, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, you've got to have peace. The peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's kind of the, uh, the jest, maybe long and short, of what I had to say for. And when I talked to Steve, it was such a blessing. I mean, I went in and I was wanted. I was desired. I was welcomed. I was thanked. And uh, it was such a blessing. Steve's remarks about his aunt and his uncle were that they were just old-time, polite, old-time people. Nice, polite, old-time people. They have that old-time courtesy that is a blessing. And your manner of life is known just like theirs is known, just like mine is known. Your manner of life is known. Your manner of life from a youngster, these girls, these youngsters, these young fellas, everybody right on through. People know you, and they have known you, and they know your manner of life. Now, uh, when I think about courtesy... I'm going to talk to you about the ABCs, ABCs of manners or courtesy. Now, when I say that, I, uh, I say that because I want to talk to you about attitude. And I don't know if you enjoyed the children's song this morning, but I always enjoy the happy songs. And the children, I thought they did marvelous this morning. I could not make out everything it said because uh, I'm not 100% healed yet, just 99%. And uh, so I couldn't make it all out, but I loved it. I loved uh, what came across. That was just, that was just marvelous. That was, that was probably one of my high spots of the day. And I said to Timmy today, I said, Tim, what would you sing? What was that song you sang this morning? And he said, Gratitude Attitude. And I said, what? And he said, Gratitude Attitude. And I said, well, what else? And he said, well, that's it. That was the title of the song, Gratitude Attitude. Now, you know, if you have that kind of an attitude, uh, there's that, that kind of a mannerism about you where you're uh, grateful, you're thankful for whatever comes your way. Somebody does little things for you and you appreciate it. Uh, you uh, take what comes your way and, and uh, you have uh, your attitude is that of being grateful. You're not an ingrate, but you're very uh, full of great. That is a blessing. Uh, for those youngsters, if they put in practice what they sang, gratitude, attitude, uh, right now, starting right now, 
I mean, from a youngster on up, that'll always be a plus. That'll never go against them. That'll always be a plus. You always appreciate somebody uh, that will have the common courtesy to say thank you. They're grateful. Thank you. And gratitude, attitude. Some take everything for granted. They think the world owes them something. It doesn't. But they think it does. And uh, they're not really grateful for anything. Gratitude, attitude, that will work. All right, now there's something else in these ABCs uh, of manners and mannerisms here. Uh, and that is, not only do you need to learn to uh, have the right kind of an attitude, but you need to learn to be appreciative. You need to learn to be appreciative, perhaps, of maybe even small things that come your way. Uh, there are some things that will come your way that uh, you need to show some appreciation. Uh, it's this way. You need to uh, not only be thankful, but, you know, maybe just uh, there are various ways. There are a lot of little ways that you can show that you appreciate somebody and you appreciate what they've done. Uh, you can tell them. You can send them a thank you note. Uh, you can. There's all kind of ways that you can show appreciation. And you need to do that. You need to have an attitude of appreciation. And that will always be a plus. Now, there's something else, and that is that... You don't ever want to get too big to admit, I blew it. And some people, they can never, ever admit anything. They're, you don't go through life that way. Somewhere down the line, you'll be on the carpet and you will have to admit that I did or I did not. Somewhere down the line, if it's not down the line, uh, out the road somewhere, on the other side sometime, uh, you have to admit the problem is me, uh, the problem it is I, it is I, it is I, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You have to admit some things that never goes against you when you say, man, I can't believe what a bozo I was. Man, I can't believe how I bombed on. I can't believe what a fool I made of myself to admit that, yes, I was wrong. Now, not only that, you know, it's not just uh, attitude, it's not just appreciation, it's not just admitting something, but admitting it, you then apologize. Apologize. And some people, they think they're just too big to apologize for anything. No, you're not. You need to learn to apologize, to be able to say, I am sorry. I've done wrong. I am sorry. I don't know why I did it. I should have never did it. I am very sorry. I'm extremely sorry. I could not be more sorry. I am sorry. And it doesn't hurt you to have that kind of a mannerism. I'm not talking about, you know, being in a corner all the time and you're always apologetic. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you have done wrong. Then you admit, I have done wrong. And you also apologize. You don't just admit it, but you apologize. I've done wrong. I've done wrong against you. I'm very sorry for what I've done against you. And ask for uh, their forgiveness. And you apologize to them. That's as far as you can go. So there's some things, when I say the ABCs, uh, there's some things for you to consider. You consider attitude. You consider appreciation. You consider admitting you're wrong. You consider apology. And you consider uh, appreciation. Sometimes folks do things for you, and uh, it goes without notice. And at times it's always going to be that way, and you don't have to make over every little thing. Uh, but, you know, Don, you need to show, be able to show that you do appreciate what is done for you by your wife, what's done for you by your husband, what's done for you by your parents, what's done for you over and over again. You need to learn appreciation. Some people, they never have. Some people think the world owes them something. Some people feel like they're always shortchanged. They're not appreciative of anything. It's always very refreshing when you get around somebody that does appreciate even little things that you do for them. You don't go wrong with the right kind of manners. All right, now one more thing, and we'll go on to B. One more thing, and that is, uh, you take nothing before you ask. You ask before you take anything. You don't take that uh, this belongs to me, I deserve this, I take this, I take that. You ask before you take anything. Around the church, you have this kind of a situation. We're the church. I don't own the church. 
However, I have had people that feel like I'm a member of the church, so they just take what they want. They take this, they take that, they don't ask. If they ask, sure. A church, you got to run a different run than you run your own business. You can run your own business, your own home, any way you want to run it. In a church, I've got to be this way. Uh, myself and the trustees, we've got to be generous. But we've got to be careful. We can't just throw everything away. We've got to look at numbers. We've got to look at how things go. We've got to see how things, you know, what's coming in. All right, you've got to add things up. You can't just blindly say, sure, do that, do that, do that. Uh, but you've also got to be generous. When Salem Baptist Temple is being started over yonder, my brother-in-law said, uh, go ask Pastor Henniger how much you'd want for a baby crib. They had, you know, a couple people over there with babies at that time. And so I went out on Monday, and he was working in his office there, and I said, uh, Jim Gillespie needs uh, that church over there. They need a, a baby crib. How much went for a baby crib? He said, take one. And I, so I went and took one. And uh, so you've got to be that way. Sometimes you say, yeah, go ahead, take one. But you always ask. I didn't go in and say, this church, man, they've got tons of money. That church don't have anything over there. All I want is one crib. they got 50 cribs here. They don't need all these. I'll just take one. No, you don't do that. You don't help yourself to anything that belongs to anybody else. You ask. You don't take one thing. You don't ever take anything that doesn't belong to you without you asking first. Number one, you ask. That's only courtesy. That's common courtesy. That's minding your manners. All right, now, have you learned what I said? What I say? I said, this ABCs of manners. And I said, uh, you be careful with your attitude. You have a gratitude attitude. All right? You admit it when you're wrong. And you apologize after you admit that I have done wrong. And you appreciate even little things that people do for you. And you make sure that you always ask before you take anything. I mean any little thing. You ask before you take anything that does not belong to you. That's good manners. All right, now, B, the ABCs of manners. And your manner is known, and my manner is known. All right, now, B. You know, in uh, the book of 1 Peter, you have, uh, you have, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's, uh, it's be sober and be uh, uh, vigilant and be humble. It's kind of like B, 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 you know, a bunch of B's there. And so, likewise, uh, you be kind. You're told in the Bible to be kind, tender-hearted, one towards another, and uh, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be kind. Be sober. Not just a jester and a joker all you lie. Sometimes you need to sober up. There's some things, nothing funny about them. All right, so you're sober, vigilant. You can't stick your head in the sand. You've always got to be careful. The devil's waiting right outside the door. He's waiting for you as quickly as you leave this building. So you're vigilant. And you've got to be humble. If you're not, you're going to be humbled. If you'll not humble yourself, and the Bible says, humble yourself in the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. If you refuse to humble yourself, then you'll be humbled. Some way, somehow, sometime. You will be humbled. And so those are some bees to be uh, concerned about. Be prompt in returning things that you have borrowed. And uh, don't make other people wait to ask you for what you have borrowed. And I have heard complaints of uh, over the years of somebody that's borrowed something. They never bring it back. You've always got to go ask them for that which is yours. They borrow a tool, they borrow this, they borrow that, they borrow something else, and they never bring it back. You've got to go to them. That is not right. There's nothing about that that's right. That's not even close to right. If you borrow something from somebody, then you'd be very prompt in returning it. If you say, uh, I need it for a couple of hours, and a couple of hours you uh, go to work with it, you get it right back to where you got it. If you say a couple of days and you uh, work hard, so in a couple of days you're all done with it, you take it back in a couple of days, whatever it is, you'd be very prompt in returning that which you have borrowed. All right? B's. A, B, C's, the manners. And not only that, 
When you return it, I want you to consider the word better. When you return it, don't give them a piece of junk that they say, that's my chainsaw. Well, it was. I've got a box of parts over there right now that was my chainsaw until it got borrowed. It came back with a color bar looking about like that and I guess I probably can straighten the thing up and it came back the, you know, this in pieces, that in pieces there and I just said, forget it. Don't do that. Whenever you uh, take something back to somebody, take it back in as good a shape as what you got it or take it back in better shape than what you got it. And you know what the signs say in the antique shops? You break it, what? You buy it. One time I borrowed a truck off a friend of mine. It was back in the old days. That truck's about a 55 Chevrolet. And uh, it had kind of wrapped to the engine there. And so uh, I, uh, I borrowed that truck. And as, you know, uh, my lot in life, my lesson in life was, uh, I'm, I got to 30th Street Market one day and all of a sudden, bang, man, that rod let loose. And uh, so uh, I told my friend, I said, oh, that's okay. I said, no, I need to get you another engine. And so uh, this one fellow worked for us said, uh, well, I'll take her down to my house. I'll stick an engine in for you. We'll get an engine. We'll stick an engine in. And so he pulled that thing, and he's trying to be funny. And he pulled me across the expressway at 55 miles an hour. I mean, you know, he's just one of those wild, crazy guys. You know, we finally did get to the destination down south of town, and he stuck another engine in it, and it was at my, you know, I paid the fee. I borrowed it for a little bit of something. That rod was about to go anyhow. That rod went. And he said, I'll oh, forget it. No, I took it back to him with an engine that did not have a rat in it. I took it back with another engine in it. It cost me some money to do it. But I took it back in better shape than when I got it. Uh, back uh, when we were building the church here, Bob Burns let us use his truck, let us use this, use anything we had. As a matter of fact, the carpet we originally had, uh, we went. I went to Rose Rug one time to buy some carpet, and uh, they looked at me from the office there, and I'd been there and looked at this, looked at that. I guess he thought, you know, I'm going to make a fool out of this guy. And uh, so I waited about, I guess, 20 minutes. They never came out of the office. I said, you know, I'm out of here. And I went out there and Bob says, oh, don't fool from any high thing. Go down to Georgia and take my truck. Go down to Georgia. You save yourself a lot of money. So Urban and I, we gassed the thing up on a Friday night. Urban tuned the thing up, put some spark plugs in it. And uh, we gassed the thing up out there on West Tusk. And away we went. Drove all night. Went down to Georgia. We got the carpet there. Slept a couple of winks there in the park. Turned around and Urban bought, drove me all the way back. We come back. That pickup truck was sitting like that. We had three big old rolls of carpet there. And we go come down through there and, and uh, got back to the church there. But when I took the truck back to Bob, uh, a lot of times I'd borrow it. And it's said, oh, don't put no gas in. You don't need to put no gas in. I always took it back with more gas than when I got it. You want to you borrow something from somebody, you take it back in better condition than when you got it. Or if it breaks, then you uh, have the common courtesy and say, oh, well, you know, uh, tough luck. You don't do that. You say, it's on me. I will take care of it. And you have enough, uh, what can I say, wherewithal about you, enough manners about you. So when you take something back, you take it back in better shape than when you got it. This is just common courtesy, is it not? My manner of life from my youth, everybody knows. All right, now I'll take this business here, uh, B, A, B. Uh, what about one more? Let's try another one here. Let's take uh, bad language. Bad language. Bad language never flies. It's always a no-no. You don't use any kind of slang. You don't use any uh, little terms. You don't tag anybody. You are uh, such and such. You use no bad language whatsoever. You want to have mannerisms of enough about you that you are never known for bad language. My manner of life from my youth on up, they know your manner of life. They know how you talk. They know what kind of language you, uh, you, you uh, use. Uh, they know what you are known for. And you want to make sure that you are never, ever known for bad language. There are some people that can't talk without using bad language. No matter what they say, I don't know what they're trying to prove, how tough they are or something, uh, something's got to come out. You never see them, you never talk to them without something along the lines of bad language. It's a no-no. That is not good manners. You don't ever want to be known for that. No, not at all. Now take your Bible and go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, be courteous. 
Oh, no. Not only that, nine, not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. You don't ever use bad language. You are always out to be a blessing. That's your goal, to be a blessing. You look at how you can be a blessing to somebody. You look at how you can talk to somebody and be a blessing. You determine that I, I want to be a blessing, and if you will be a blessing, look what follows. In verse number 9, the Bible says, uh, Contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. So if you ever heard me say, be a blessing, get a blessing, there you go. That's why you say that. If you're not going to be a blessing, don't expect a blessing. It's not going to come your way. I mean, you crash on the rocks and nobody's even going to pick you up. They could care less. If you're a blessing, they're going to help you. They're going to pick you up. They're going to hold you up. They're going to uh, be the Aaron and her. They're going to prop you up. Uh, there's going to be somebody before, somebody behind. You're not going to go down. They're going to make sure you don't go down. You be a blessing, you will get a blessing. And you need to determine that I want to be a blessing. I want to have that much courtesy. I don't want to be a curse to anybody. I don't want to be a hurt to anybody. I certainly do not want to be a curse to any of these youngsters here. Uh, I want to be a blessing. And I know that one day uh, the blessing is going to come back to me. I will inherit a blessing. All right, so those are things that you need to be extremely careful about along the lines of the ABCs of manners. Be kind. Be prompt in returning things. Make sure they're better than they were when you got it. Uh, also, don't take anything that doesn't belong to you. No bad language. And be a blessing. The ABCs. Of courtesy. Now in verse number 8 in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, Be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love his brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. A, B, C's. C, courteous. All right, now it says, uh, One of another. Having compassion one of another. All right, now let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and let's, uh, let's look at verse number 1. Likewise, ye wives. All right, let's try a little courtesy on the ladies' side. Now, it's always, and I was always taught, you hold the door for the young lady. You always walk on the outside. Don't ever make her think she's expendable because you walk on the inside while she's on the outside and she can get nailed. Uh, you, you help her with her coat. You are courteous to the lady. But there are two sides to it. All right. Here's the wife's side. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Uh, show him enough courtesy that you are willing to take your place, which is not top banana. It is second place. Give your husband enough courtesy to back off, back it down, and shove him, if you've got to do it, shove him to the front. All right. To your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fears. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, wearing of gold, putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. A meek and quiet spirit. Somebody that's not going to be alarmed at every little thing. Somebody who's, they may not be weak, but they're not going to be top dog. They're not going to try to push him around. They're not going to try to call the shots. They're going to be in subjection. They're going to take their place. They're going to give him the common courtesy of taking their place. And they're going to show to him in common courtesy, every wife needs to do this, give him the common courtesy of a meek and let me read it again quiet spirit a meek and quiet spirit not one where you push 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 you know what you want and you push till you get what you want meek you back down you realize let him carry the ball he needs to carry the ball 
He can carry the ball. He does exceptionally well. He fulfills his obligations. And you back down with the meek and quiet spirit. That's common courtesy of a wife toward her husband. All right, it says, uh, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, the ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, which is inside of God of great price. For after this manner, this manner, in the old time, I like what Steve said, my aunt and uncle, they just have the old time politeness about them. And the women in the old time, they took their place. They backed down. They didn't try to be boss of the applesauce. They didn't try to run the show and run the man around like he's a little puppy dog. They did not do that. Common courtesy, you be like the women with the old time politeness. Go ask Ruby Smale what it's all about. Uh, old time. Uh, and the Bible says they're being subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. The way she addressed him. Common courtesy. I'm not saying you address him as Lord. But you can show that uh, I'm your wife. I'm thankful to be your wife. I certainly esteem you very highly. I'm very appreciative of all that you do all the time and how hard you work and what you do, and I do appreciate it. And so uh, common courtesy goes both ways. Even if Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are as long as you do well and are not afraid of any amazement. Now the two sides of the story and always is. And the other side is common courtesy toward your wife. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Okay? You fellas ought to give her the common courtesy of knowing that she is the weaker vessel, but knowing what makes her tick. All right, now, for example, tomorrow Shirley's going to add one more to 29 or 39, I don't know what it is. One of them numbers there, she's going to have to add one more tomorrow. And so... Uh, it says, dwell from according to knowledge. I know what makes her tick. Monday is what? Get out the scrub board and let's go at it. So tomorrow, all I expect sure it's her birthday. So all she got to do, there's a mountain of washing down there. Man, there's big old towels down there. There's a, I don't know what all, but you know, man, she can go at it. I mean, that's what makes her tick. I know what makes her tick. So tomorrow's her birthday. I'll let her wash clothes all day long. The water's all softened. She can go out. She can have a wonderful birthday. Have a wonderful birthday. <laughs> now, even you know my wife better than that. <laughs> and I know what makes her tick. And so, tomorrow especially, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what she wants to do. I'm going to say, why don't we go out and eat? Oh, don't bother cooking today breaking the routine, you know what makes her tick. You're supposed to. If you don't, then you're not fulfilled. You're not giving her the common courtesy of showing to her that she is your ever-loving wife, and you love her as much as you ever loved her, and you, uh, you are concerned, you want the best of everything for her all the time. Dwell them according to knowledge. You've got to show common courtesy their way. Fellas, you know exactly what your wife likes, what she enjoys, what makes a good day for her, and you dwell with them that way, giving honor unto the wife. Not dishonor. Not, hey, you. Give honor unto them. Every now and then it doesn't hurt to call them honey. Every now and then it doesn't hurt to call them dear, darling. Sometimes I have to laugh when I'm doing that, you know, but I do it, <laughs> you know. And, uh, Honey, that's pretty well, that's natural. But uh, sometimes I'll, you know, get kind of funny and, and I'll use some kind of a term, you know, darling, you know. And, uh, so uh, she knows it's just kind of a, uh, what do you want now? You know, one of those deals. Uh, but uh, you show them the common courtesy of dwelling with them uh, according to knowledge and giving honor unto the wife. I enjoy opening the door for my wife. Say, do it all the time? A lot of the time. Maybe not 100%, but a lot of the time. If I, you know, go around and open the truck door, i got to push button open the right now for her. But a lot of times, I'll just go to her side of the door, unlock the door, 
Help the little lady in. Just common courtesy. You don't go wrong that way. They like it. They like to be known that you still think extremely highly of them. And they're not just your slave, you know. And who was your slave last year? They know that that's not your feelings. That's not your intent. You've got to show something their way. It's called common courtesy. Somebody defined it uh, one time. Courtesy is when you think of others. Lack of courtesy shows that you think only of self. I repeat, I thought it was real good. Courtesy shows that you think of others, not self. When you refuse to show courtesy, that shows you're thinking only of self. Absolutely only of self. Courtesy, that's in order. It's in order, one for another, for the wife towards the husband. It's in order, especially, for the husband towards the wife. All right, now, let's take some things as far as the children. And it says here, be ye all of one mind. And then it says, be courteous. All right, so let's just take the generalities. All right, let's show some common courtesy and say, we're going down to the hospital now. And, and uh, I'm going to go see Janice. Janice is in the so I'm, I'm hopping on the elevator now. And she's in the room, uh, whatever room she's in there. And I went up there, and, I, and so I'm waiting around. I got to see you. I had a nice visit with Janice. But when I get in an elevator there, I see a sign. The sign says, cover your mouth when you cough. Now, you know, whenever somebody coughs, well, all the stuff they got going these days, you're, you feel like going, you don't show up, but you feel like going like that. But whenever somebody covers their mouth, that shows that they have some courtesy to them. And whenever you cough, you want to learn to cover your mouth with your hand, with your handkerchief, Cover your mouth. That's just common courtesy. And you need to show that uh, if you yawn. Nobody wants to see what kind of a big mouth and tit you got. Cover your mouth, you know. <sighs> you know. Why don't you just cover your mouth and show some courtesy. So little things. All right, take another thing. This little thing. Uh, take the business about, oh, uh, say a card. Show your brothers and sisters that you do care for them. Send a card. When somebody's sick, it doesn't hurt. Send a card. And that's not a lot. It's not really necessary. It's a courtesy. It's just simply, it's common courtesy. Little card, praying for you. Appreciate you. Love you a lot in the Lord. And uh, that'll mean more to them than what you could ever imagine. If you live next door, I'd go knock on the door and I'd just say, how you doing? And uh, I'd go in, I'd just kind of look around, I'd talk to her about two minutes, and I could tell she's having a good day, bad day, no good. I, I could tell she's having a good day. So, okay, i got to do this, 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 and I'll see you later. And I'd go. But I went in there just to sort of feel the temperature, just see how she's doing. You know, sometimes a call by you would mean a lot. All right, Janice told me, she said, these ladies, I just love them. And, of course, you know who she's referring to. And she said, uh, they call me. Every day. I get a phone call every day. They check on me every day. They're not being nosy. They got plenty of stuff to do. They got their own things to do. That's just a courtesy call. That's just called common courtesy. A phone call. How's it going? Good. I'm glad it's going a little bit better. Wonderful. And I'm going to pray for you. I hope it goes a whole lot better. Hope you get, you know, thus and such. And you make the phone call. That's not a big thing, but it's little. But you can imagine how somebody would feel under certain conditions. So courtesy. All right, something else. This is just common. And uh, this would be uh, maybe along the lines of showing something for somebody, uh, a courtesy call or a courtesy gift. Just a little gift showing some thoughtfulness. Especially you fellows towards your wife. Just a little something. Just, you know, a little gift that shows I'm thinking about you, and I love you, and I appreciate what you do for me. And just something like that. Common courtesy. All right, now, uh, along these lines, also consider your company. And you make them comfortable. And when somebody comes to your house, be a blessing. Don't say, oh, no. 
And don't go into this thing, oh, my house. I don't care about you. To see what you got here, what you got there. They came to see you. And if somebody comes even unexpected. Now, Don Hillier, he's got this thing. That's the way I like to go. Because he said, if you call ahead of time, they even got the dog scrubbed up. <laughs> but he said, I like to go in there and then you can see the real picture. I just kind of like to go by surprise. And, you know, some people you can do that. Some people you can't. And so you don't take somebody, you know, they're bothered when you surprise them and just, you know, aggravate them. It's, you're not a blessing. But some people don't matter. So, well, there it is. That's how we live. I got kids. Uh, kids like to play. And uh, there's times I go to my house, grandkids over there. I can't even get in the living room. I mean, first thing I hear is, man, everything jumped out. And a big old noise in there all across the floor. I mean, it's like you're going like that, trying to even get find a place to sit, you know. That's how we live. That's my house. When the grandkids are there, they're there. They're building. They're playing. Nathaniel, I mean, he's in the living room. He's in the hall. He's in the kitchen. He's always got a truck. Room, room, room. You know, a tractor. He's pushing that thing, you know, and, and bang, into this. And he turns around, bang, into this. That's how we live. And uh, But when you have company, even unexpected company, it's only common courtesy to make them feel welcome and show something their way. And when they're leaving, don't show to them, wow, I'm sure glad they left. And you know how people do that? <laughs> you leave, and the light goes off, and you're not even out of the driveway. Oh, well, uh, I guess they're really glad I came. Uh, no, you make sure that you leave that light on until they back out of the driveway. And when they start up the road, you go like that, see ya. And uh, they're going up, up the road until they're... You know, out of sight, then you go on in and flip off the light and go on in and go to bed. But you don't, you know, before they, I mean, hardly get out of the driveway, hardly get going. Turn the light off, man, I, you know. It's as though, why did I bother stopping, you know. That's kind of a, that was a plot, you know. Uh, you don't do that. Common courtesy, uh, you show some courtesy toward your company. Also, common courtesy, when it comes to chores. Now, you know, we've got... Some farmers here. Steve likes the outdoors. He's Mr. Farmer. He got the Sunheimer girls, and they know what it's all about. And have a few chores, to say the least. And some of you others know as well. You've got chores you got to do. Whenever there are chores to be done, and you're going to help somebody, you don't just help them for a minute and then leave it with them. And away you go. I got to go. You know, I'll see you later. You help them until they're done. If you got to do dishes. You don't just bail out. You just, you know, lend a hand, dry the dishes till all the dishes are done, all washed, all done, all dried, all put in the cupboard. You know, help with the chores until they're done. That's just common courtesy to do things like that. All right, it's common courtesy also uh, for you to be coachable. Some people, you can't tell them anything. You need to be coachable by your parents. They need to be able to train you up in the way you should go. You need to be taught. You need coached. Some people in, say, athletic uh, world, they have natural ability and they do pretty good. If they had a coach, they would be outstanding. They need to be coached. Likewise, some of y'all do pretty fair, but don't be someone that your parents cannot coach you and tell you this is the way something really needs to be done. Don't be somebody that way. Be coachable. Be somebody. Your pastor uh, can correct a situation, tell you something, and uh, be that way. I've got to be that way. Example, my father-in-law, he was 90 years of age when I was about 40 years of age, 50 years of age, whatever I was. So one day Pop says to me, he says, Art, he says, you know, uh, when I was in sales, he sold cigarette sewing machines and I don't know what else he sold. But he said, when I was in sales, he says, they taught us to stand up straight. You know, like that. Well, you know, Bricklayer never stands up straight. He's, you know, for the most part, he's down here, he's up here, he's up here, he's up here. And, uh, you know, stand up straight. You know, you know, you very rarely stand up straight. And so, I'm not used to, I'm not in sales, and so I'm not used to that. However, 
when Pop told me that, I thought, that's right. And so from time to time, I'll be sitting here and, and I'll, you know, I'll be sitting here like this and I think, like this. Or I'll be standing up here at the last song uh, before the preaching. And I'll be standing here and I'll be, you know, like this. And I'll go like that. See me do that? That's because I was coached. I didn't have any sense, but I was coached. And you likewise need to be coachable. Somebody, when uh, they try to tell you something, analyze, deduct. Well, of course, that presentation, that first impression, that's real important. All right, so it's important for me and it's important for you that you are coachable. Common courtesy would cause you to do that. All right, I said the ABCs. Well, A, B, C, D. Now, let's try this long lines of courtesy. What about dressing properly for the occasion? You have an occasion, something to go to? Dress properly for the occasion. All right, let's try it again. Let's try the doorbell. You know how some people are? I mean, you're in your living room and all of a sudden, where did you come from? I mean, they're, they're on you. Common courtesy is, you ring the doorbell. I say, well, yours don't work. Well, you know, you can hear that. You know, knock the door down, you know, if you got to, but show a little courtesy. You don't just, you know, barge in on somebody, uh, you know, like that, you know, well, I didn't mean to scare you, you know. Uh, I have people do that all the time. No, you don't want to, don't be someone that way. Use the doorbell. Don't you go in, take somebody by surprise and see if you can, ah, you know, say, oh, I scared you. You know, don't do that. Use the doorbell. All right. Don't snoop. Now, at my house, my grandkids love to come to my house because I have golf clubs, I have Bibles, I have, I got a magnifying glass. That's the latest thing, Ruth. <laughs> they love that. Oh, Grandpa, where'd you get this? You know, I've got all kind of knickknacks, doodads, and I like it all. I'm a big kid, and they like it too. But you know what they do? They come in. I had one of them about a couple of weeks ago come in. And he was laying down on the floor looking under the bed. You know, he's telling me what I had under the bed, you know. And uh, don't snoop. You go to somebody's house, it's not polite. It's not, doesn't show any courtesy at all whenever you snoop around, walk around. I've had some of them, you know, people come to my house, they walk around my house. They go from room to room. They look around, see what I got here, see what I got there, and uh, see what's around my house. And I don't have nothing to hide. I don't care. If you can count up to about 30, you can count Bibles in my bedroom. And if you, uh, you know, that doesn't matter to me, except it's not, it's not, no, it's not courtesy. It's not, uh, it's not polite. It's not mannerly to do that. And so you don't snoop. When I go to somebody's house, if they invite me in the living room, I go in the living room. And I don't, you know, weasel my way over here somewhere and look in there. I go in, I sit down, and I talk to them. And if they say, uh, let's go have a cup of coffee, I'll say, well, I'll drink coffee, I'll take a glass of water. And I'll go out in the kitchen and have a glass of water. But outside of that, I'm not going to snoop all over the house and see, oh, you got a TV in your bedroom. Oh, I, I thought you were spiritual. Uh, you got a computer in your bedroom. <laughs> I thought you had something going. I know you don't have nothing going. I'm not going to do that because I don't care. I'm going to show some courtesy. And it's not polite to snoop. Don't snoop. Uh, if somebody has something hidden under the bed, then that's because they want it hidden. And they, they want it on top of the bed. For you to see, it'd be on top of the bed. See? And so, uh, show some courtesy that way. Now, one more thing, and that is that we're running out of time, so I've got to show some courtesy towards you. I'm going to hurry up. Don't laugh. <laughs> now, uh, that, you say, Brother Martin, you said be sober. You mean I can't never laugh? Yeah, you can laugh. Man, the Lord laughs. Of course, what he laughs at, uh, I don't know if you want to, you know, laugh that way, but it puts this way. Uh, you want to make sure that you never laugh at somebody's weaknesses. Do not, D, do not laugh at somebody's weakness. That's called the laughter of superiority. You know, people like that, you do something wrong, <laughs> they can't hardly stop laughing because you did something wrong. They like you down here, and they like to be up here. The laughter of superiority. You can laugh, you can smile, but you never 
laugh at somebody's weaknesses, somebody's blunder. You don't laugh at that and make them feel ten times worse. You don't, it's not, don't ever show the laughter of superiority. If you feel that way, do not show a laughter of superiority. Okay, uh, not only that, E. And uh, I'm going to be done now. A, B, C, D, E. Is that how it goes? That one, is that the way it goes, Aubrey? I guess it is. She's sort of laughing at me. So uh, this is kind of funny. I said it's going to be light, and I'll be done here in just a minute. Uh, but I want you to uh, keep smiling, but I don't want you to be laughing. I saw Glenn Mays' picture in the paper, and I said, that's him. Glenn Mays, that guy always smiled from ear to ear. Last time I saw him at the hospital, he was this man. He was just barely getting there. And he said, I like your church. I like going to your church. I think the only time I ever came is when he heard Dr. Ruckman. <laughs> but I like your church. But Glenn Mays always had a big old smile. When I saw that picture in the paper, I said, that's him. I bet he's really smiling now. You want to, you know, smile's fine, but the laughter of superiority, uh, you don't want that. Now, last of all, uh, E. Now... You respect your elders, right? That's E. That's just common courtesy to show respect to your elders. All right, not only that. You be somebody who's easy to be entreated. Easy. Some people, you can't tell anything. No matter what you say, they argue. Right now, they're going to argue with you. That has to do with the spirit that's not of the Lord. That's of this world. The spirit that's from above, the Lord. The spirit from above is first easy to be entreated. You be somebody that is easy. You can be told something. And you will accept it. You'll think of it and say, man, why didn't I think of that? And I'm glad you told me that. Easy to be entreated. All right, now, uh, this is important. Uh, your eating habits. You're not a hog. So your eating habits, uh, you chew your food. We went to the restaurant day and Sarah said, I'm always the last one eating. I said, you must chew your food up. I guess that probably identifies it. Chew your food up. You're not a hog. You don't have to see how quickly you can eat and, you know, scarf it down. Your eating habits are important. Don't slurp. And don't be sloppy. Use a napkin. Uh-oh, she's looking at me. Because I forget to use my napkin. And I say, well, oh man, we just got these pants out of the cleaners. Got to go back to the cleaners. You know what that ranch dressing does? That's greasy. And so there they go. Oh, think you can get that out of my tie? Man, here we go again. Why don't you use your napkin? You're supposed to put your napkin on your lap. Use your napkin. You know? uh, don't be sloppy. Don't slur. Uh, don't, don't drink the dregs. You know what the dregs are? That's, there's none in here. But the dregs are like what's at the bottom. You know? All right? You eat your cereal. You get down to the bottom and you grab your plate and you go like that. That's the dregs. That is not good manners. Take what you can get your spoon, and so you lose about a tenth of a teaspoon. Big deal. Learn to have some manners. Don't be dunking your donuts. <laughs> Say, I like to dunk. <laughs> not good manners. Don't do it in public. If you're going to do it, don't do it in public. But your eating habits are real important. All right, now one last thing, and that has to do with exercise. You uh, exercise outside. It's not good manners to exercise on the bed, you know. And kids love to exercise on the bed. They love to, you know, like that. And look at me. Man, this is like a trampoline. They like to jump on a bed. But that's not good manners. And if they can't jump on the bed, they like a couch. Come to my house. I got a couch. Got three sections. The middle section, when you're sitting at, you go, <laughs> you go all the way down. You know why? Because one of my grandkids, I don't know which one, since I got 18, I'm not going to blame anybody. But one of them, 
uh, they like to, you know, uh, they like to jump on my couch and do your exercise outside. Inside, you know, very limited. But certainly, uh, you wouldn't want to do something like that. You wouldn't want to do damage anywhere. Uh, you want to be real careful that way. Exercise. Now, and I guess I'll go on to the last thing, and that's entertain. And you entertain strangers, but don't be somebody that always is the star of the show. You're entertaining. You can play the piano. You can... I don't know what. That's fine if they ask you, Hey, play me a song. I want to hear you play. I preached uh, this morning on uh, the blind man, two blind men, or a couple of them, and two more. Uh, we talked about that. And I thought about the three blind mice. Two blind men, three blind mice. So I was entertained today. Sarah played... Three blind mice, you're not hear her play that. She can play it this way, she can play it this way, and she can play it this way, and she can play it this way, she can play it this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. I mean, I, I mean, it comes out like about nine blind mice, you know. And it's kind of, but, you know, I like to hear that. She's not just doing that to prove something to me. She's trying to be a blessing. And so, that is fine. But some people, they just want to, they've got to get attention to them, so they're going to entertain and get attention to them. And if it's asked for, fine. If it's for the right reason, fine. But not just to make you the big star of the show all the time. Now, those are the A, B, C, D, E of good manners. And your manners, like my manners, uh, they're known from a child. And so maybe it's something you need to improve on. Try to improve. Make people enjoy being around you. Likewise in the church. We need to do the same thing. And uh, like I was taught manners as a child, likewise you should be. You need to be. And as you grow up, I was never, you know, a situation where I had to forget or could forget manners. Uh, likewise, perhaps that's the way it is with you. Uh, but you want to make sure that you have the common courtesy to show some manners to those that are around about you and to your elders. And you protect the girls. You be polite to girls. You pay for the girls' hamburger. Uh, you open the door for the girls. You're always concerned. You young men, you be concerned that you protect those young ladies at all times. Common courtesy. Mind your manners. Father, we're thankful for uh, this lesson here, Lord, and the applications from the Word of God. And I pray, Lord, that it be heard by everybody here. The youngsters, plenty for them. The wives, something for them. The husbands, something for them. Each one towards another, plenty. And, Lord, may it be heard, may it be received, and may this church here, may it be a church where... The people that come through here get a blessing. They're treated right. What they see is that which is a blessing to them. And help us never to forget to be a blessing and to inherit a blessing. And Lord, once again, for your blessing upon this simple message tonight, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing just a little bit and we'll go. You need to stand here and uh, stretch a little bit and get you, uh, just uh, warm your heart up a little bit with the song. Number 17. 17, a couple of verses, just uh, a couple of short verses. You do what God wants you to do. He wants you to hear what was said tonight. And you won't go wrong by improving on your mannerisms, your manners, and your courtesy. you never go wrong. Make sure you heard what was said. I tried my best to put it out with the right kind of a spirit toward you. You receive it likewise. Sing a couple verses and do what God wants you to do. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. What I am waiting, yielded and still. 
Now there's a word of warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You've got good manners. You maintain them. You watch your company. Your company will get you to go that way. You do not do that. You be extremely careful. Don't kid yourself. That's always a tendency. You've been taught manners. You maintain manners. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 11 says, What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy manner, uh, holy conversation and godliness? Your mannerisms ought to be that which reflects the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, and all holy conversation and godliness. Is it? If not, let's do something about it. One more verse and we're going. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Okay, that was uh, P.S. You say, oh, a lot more than P.S. Well, it was basically just P.S., mind your manners. Okay, closing prayer at this time. And uh, Tim, why don't you go ahead and close out with prayer.